testing. This is the Silicon Valley Linux Users Group, February 7th, 2012, and the talk is about the Linux on the Raspberry Pi platform. And if you'd be kind enough to post something from the main mailing list, that would be really okay. cool. And very well. Is it possible to drive your car from the Android phone yet? Yes, it is. Depending on the car. It's possible to lock individual brakes and turn the engine off and all kinds of groovy stuff. I, I don't recommend it. So um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Scott. Um, you may have been around the valley long enough to know about Silicon Valley Code Camp. Any, anybody heard of it before? Wow, okay. Um, so Silicon Valley Code Camp is a two-day function that occurs up at Foothill College. Normally it's captive technologies, but there's a lot of open source technologies. And I've been spearheading the pressure to get more open source technologies out there for them to all hear. It's a thing where you go, you listen to a talk, you may do a constructive lab function within it. It goes for two days. But this year, it looks like they've set the date for October 6th and 7th, which means about three months from now, they should have a website up where you can select it. But if you have a talk that you'd like to give, or you know somebody who would be a really good person to have come, like, oh, maybe Linus or somebody, that would be cool. So if anybody knows something like that, or maybe Mr. Wall would come and give a presentation on Perl or something. That, that would be great. So definitely go ahead and, and if you can think of anything that might, might be interesting or you know of somebody, please uh, let me know. Uh, if you didn't, if you arrived late and didn't hear my announcement outside, if you're interested in Android routing, come see me and talk afterwards. Thank you. We're almost there. Anyone else? Um, yes, I do, actually. So, in April, um, if uh, the creek don't rise, we're going to have Larry McVoy telling the story about BitKeeper and BitMover Incorporated. He's going to um, try to, we're going to have an early start time of 5.30 p.m., although we need to double check with uh, Symantec to make sure that we're clear on that. That may actually be easier than starting at our usual time because they probably haven't gotten around to locking those doors at that point. So that's a bit of a plus. Um, by the way, this coming Saturday is a meeting of Cabal in Menlo Park in West Menlo, uh, not far from the Dutch Goose at my wife's and my house. We, it, we meet twice a month. Uh, schedule is always on LinuxMafia.com. Any uh, idea how to turn the projector? Ah. Okay. I, I have those. Go for it. Um, I, uh, since I got an Android phone about a year ago, I've been interested in getting Debian on uh, Android devices. I was a late adopter to the Android phones because I didn't really need one at the time. And in that kind of time frame, uh, Debian fell behind and in the place stepped a cyanogen with the cyanogen mod ROM. And uh, just a couple months ago, I got an, an uh, Android tablet, a Samsung, uh, no, a, a Lenovo Android tablet. And I'm afraid that Debian is now about to, to drop two generations behind the latest technology. And so um, I would, uh, for, for uh, potential speakers for this group, 
I think it would be good to get uh, cyanogen, or somebody speak about cyanogen mod, which does the ROMs for the Android phone, because this group needs to be up on the people who are putting the most advanced ROMs on these, this technology, because you kind of need to help pressure Debian and some of the other distros to get their distros on Android hardware. So that was just kind of like a speaker suggestion. Yes, thank you. I agree. Cyanogen mod is very advanced uh, ROM for, for Android devices. Um, so, you've, you've heard uh, speed, uh, <coughs> presentations from Akata before, kind of uh, multi-threat speaker and software engineer and author. Um, I remember a few of her talks on Linux and automotive applications, which have been very interesting. Um, so, she's going to be telling us about how to use Linux on um, the Arduino <laughs> boards, which are a new uh, Atmel-based um, processor and board. Um, so I should get out of the way and let you start. Okay, so this is about fun, but it's also about world domination. Because, yes. yeah, how is Linux ever going to achieve world domination? <coughs> Can you hear me? I think there's a microphone I could use if I need to. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll see if I can get this to work. Uh, if I can find the on switch. On. Is that better? Okay. So how is Linux ever going to achieve world domination if we can't control anything outside our computers? This is going on and off. Isn't it? There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, that should be better. Yeah. And you've probably seen I'm still doing this. You've probably seen hardware talks before, and they're always given by somebody. The other one. There's another one. So far, so good right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can walk around holding this all the time. See if I can put it in here. Whether it will work. No. Just run off again. Yeah. I'll try the other one, and if that doesn't work, I'll try showing. Between this and other hardware talks you've seen, is still doing it. So, hmm? is that more annoying than not having any mic? I, I think it's too directional. You need it right in front of your mouth. Yeah, I don't think it's going to stay. Try it one more time, and if it flops, yeah. Anybody got a small Band-Aid or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, well, it's, it's just been stretched out of shape by guys with big heads. Yeah, figures. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think I'm going to give up on the mic. And Tell you, tell you about hardware talks, which is where I left off. And they're always given by somebody who at the age of five was taking apart the family TV set and putting it back together and making it better and ever since then has been building amazing stuff. And well, that's not me. This isn't working either. Wow, what a day. <laughs> So I'm kind of a hardware class. And it's not that I wasn't taking apart the family TV set, it's that I didn't always get it back together. Yeah. <laughs> or if I got it back together, maybe it didn't work. And the reason I tell you this is to tell you that the great thing about Arduinos, which I'm gonna be talking about today, is that they're so easy to use that anybody can do it. In fact, I'm gonna be giving a class to high school students pretty soon, I don't think they'll have any trouble with it. So I wanna encourage you You'll see how easy it is. Uh, I've seen circuit that. diagram, you know, if you look at a circuit diagram and it looks like this, don't worry about it because you can 
get by, at least with simple stuff. Eventually, you will be seeing circuit diagrams like this, and you'll have to deal with that. But you can do a lot of stuff w with Arduinos without worrying about that sort of thing. <coughs> and <laughs> now everybody's getting into the action. There's Make Magazine. There are articles in Wired Magazine. The maker movement is big. And everybody loves building stuff. Everybody loves making that easier. And of course, open source technology is adding to all of that. You've got hacker spaces coming up, hack fests where kids, people of all ages can get together and build things. These kids are building robots out of cardboard. And you can have things that actually move and connect to motors and, yes, connect to computers and Arduinos. So what is an Arduino? It's a microcontroller. So it's a little computer. It's not like, it's not a computer that can run Linux. It's not that powerful. It can talk to Linux. It can be programmed from Linux. But it's very slow. It's a 16-bit processor. It has very little RAM. But it costs $30. And of course, everybody's excited about the Raspberry Pi, which costs about the same amount, except you can't actually buy one. You can buy an Arduino anywhere. You can go to Fry's, you can go to Micro Center, you can order one online. And it's open source hardware. I'll talk about that in a second. But look at it in a little more detail. It's got 13 digital I.O. pins, so you can read input from all sorts of devices digitally. It also has analog input pins, and I'll show you why that's useful later on. It can, it can power things, small devices, at 3.3 volts or 5 volts. This is the CPU here. You can power it externally, or you can power it from your USB, and you can program it from USB. And it's not made in China. No, it's made in Italy. Most of it. Yeah. Arduino. <laughs> exactly. And I mentioned that it was open source hardware. And what that means is that the Arduino company, which sells these, will let you make one too. They put their plans on the web, and anybody can make a clone. You can make a clone at home, or you can buy lots of different types. And you can buy. Just intermittent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Use a mouse. This first. is the CPU chip in the Arduino. So here's an Arduino that's no bigger than the CPU that goes into it. This is about the same size. This is even smaller because it uses a surface mounted version. These are clones that look just like the original one but are made by different companies. So you can get all sorts of form factors. And you can even make your own. <laughs> This is one I made on a breadboard. It costs about $8 in parts, less if you're doing it in quantity. So if you prototype something with an Arduino and you want to go into production, you don't have to buy $30 devices over and over. You can, you can get the cost way down. You can also get weird form factors. This is a lily pad. It, it's very small. It's about, it's about that big. It's flexible. It's waterproof. It's washable. You sew it with conductive thread. So you can sew it into your clothing, and you can make clothing that has LEDs and sensors and all sorts of things. I haven't done this myself. I don't have any demos. I keep thinking it would be nice to do an Arduino talk in a flashing shirt, but <laughs> I haven't gotten around to it. But you can, forgetting that doesn't work. You can make things like this global warming dress. She has CO2 sensors built into the dress, so as she walks around, the places where there are more carbon dioxide make the lights light up in a different pattern. Or you can do something simpler. You can just barely see that, but it's a jacket with turn signals built in for bicyclists. <laughs> so, okay, it's cool. How do you get started with Arduino? And it's very easy. And what everybody always starts with, the first project, is to make an LED blink, which maybe doesn't sound all that exciting inherently, but when you get your own blinking LED from something you did on your computer, it's actually pretty cool. So let's do it. I have here, where is that? Yeah. So this is a small solderless breadboard. That means you can press parts in 
anything along one of these lines is connected. So this pin of the LED is connected to this resistor, which goes to, to ground on the Arduino. This pin is connected via a wire. Oh, sorry, that's ground. This is going to pin 13. So I will wire my own Arduino up that way. This is an Arduino, actual size. If you're old, you have to use reading glasses to figure out which pin is which. Which way is which? Okay, the long pin. I'm plugging in the wire to pin 13 resistor to ground. And then you get a USB cable. Now since this is friendly open source hardware, it's not any kind of proprietary cable. It's just a USB AB cable. The big end is like the one that sticks into your printer if you have a USB printer. Did I mention I was a klutz? Arduino <laughs> again. This goes into the computer. This goes into the Arduino. We get a brief blink just to, s to show that I'm connected. No. What kind of software do we need? One of the reasons Arduino has become so popular is that it comes with a really easy to use interactive de development environment, an IDE. Which it's Java based, and don't worry if you don't like Java, you don't have to use Java. I'm kind of allergic to it myself, but I do recommend if you can, if you can stand it, start with the IDE and program that way a while and then decide if you want to do something else. So it looks like this. I don't expect you to be able to read the text there. comes with lots of examples, and I'm going to do examples, basics, <laughs> these menus are one reason I don't like Java, blank, Yay. and I have made the font bigger on that, for some reason it only remembers that for that particular program. Here's what an Arduino program looks like. Notice it's very short. It has two parts, it has setup and loop. So setup is run once at the beginning of the program, and all it says is, I'm going to use pin 13 for output. I'm going to send a signal on pin 13. You recall, that's the one I plugged the LED into. And then in loop, loop is going to be called over and over. So I'm going to write hi to the LED, meaning I'm going to turn it on. Then I'm going to delay for a thousand milliseconds, one second. I'm going to write low to turn it off, and I'm going to wait for another second. These buttons up here, there's a button labeled verify, which compiles it. Just make sure you didn't make any mistakes. It says in tiny, yeah. So there aren't any mistakes in the demo, fortunately. And then upload. Compiles it again. And you notice, and those of you in the front can see that it's blinking. Those of you in the back might have a little bit more trouble seeing it. You have to take our word for it. <laughs> you don't have to take my word for it, though, because I have a plan. Can you just get those Christmas board. lights off the table? Just, hmm? just get those Christmas lights out of the way. You can just, <laughs> I'm trying to videotape it, so. Oh, well. <laughs> well, soon you will be able to see something, I hope. Because what I also have here is something, well, I'll show you in a minute. I have another device. So I'm going to plug my other device into ground. 
bring your camera up and see what she's plugging yeah. into the ground. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's cool. <laughs> oh, this is all part of it, huh? Yes. There is a reason I had the Christmas lights there, strangely. Oh, okay. I thought they were there before. Show us what your plug looks like. I will. I will show you. I have a slide for it. Because I knew you wouldn't be able to see it. This is called a power switch tail. And I bought it for, I think it cost about $25 or $30 from Adafruit.com Make Magazine. Make, uh, Maker Shed also sells it. And what it is, is basically an AC adapter, female here, male here, with two wires coming out of it. So I plugged the black wire, which goes to the middle one, into ground on my Arduino, and I plugged the red wire into, if I go back to, I plugged the red wire in right there. Yeah, it's, it's a great big relay. And you can build this yourself. You know, <coughs> if you're good with electronics and you don't mind house current AC, you can build this yourself. I'm a little nervous about working with AC. Yes? Is that what you want to list with guys? <laughs> I don't know. Does it say anything on the label about you all this thing? Come up and check after the talk. You know, this light is about as intermittent as your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that's intentional. Was, was your microphone attached to your... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it was. Now, one other thing I want to do here. You know, I showed you this demo, and that's all, you know, it could all be like a canned demo. But let's just change it. Let's... this is really working and I'm not cheating you. I'm still connected, right? <coughs> is it, uh, yeah. So I'm sure that's super annoying to everybody and I'm going to unplug the power switch channel since it has done its purpose. So blinking LEDs are awesome and all that, right? And you can make LEDs blink all day and never get tired of it, right? OK. Maybe eventually you might want something else. So what other kind of devices can you talk to? There are lots of very simple devices you can buy. Like for a few dollars, you can buy a light sensor. This is just a photoresistor. And you can read analog input. These are the analog inputs down at the bottom in the Arduino. This is something called the pull-down resistor, which is something I never understood. I <coughs> tried to follow electronics tutorials. They always talked about pull-up and pull-down resistors. The Arduino tutorials are great. There are so many wonderful tutorials, and you'll learn all these concepts that you never thought you'd understand before. And I'm not going to try to explain a pull-up resistor right here. But, but anyway, you can, you can read how bright the light is and do something like dim your house lights when it's when it's <coughs> dimmer outside. Or you can use a sonar range finder. A little device that you can buy at Radio Shack or lots of other places. It sends out a pulse of ultrasonic sound and then receives it again to determine distance. And I bought this because I wanted to do something like a sonar Head, headset, basically, so that I could walk around doing echolocation like a bat, you know, and it would go beep, 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 as I got closer to things. And I eventually did build that, but first I built some other stuff with it. Uh, but I have my slides out of order. So here's how you read serial from an here's, I should say, here's how you write to the serial port. So when you're testing something like this, the first thing you need to do is send output from your Arduino and make sure you're getting something on the computer end. So basically, you, in setup, you set up your speed. It can speak faster than 9600 baud, but if you're just writing a line in a second or something like that, you might as well use a slow speed. And then 
do an analog read off the sensor pin, print to the serial port, wait half a second, <coughs> and repeat. So when I was testing the range finder, that was what I was doing. And let's see. One warning though, in case you try to do this, sort of the obvious thing to do is to put a lot of stuff on digital pins zero and one, and those are overloaded. Those are also used for serial communication. So I had all kinds of problems because serial wasn't working, and then when I turned off serial, things worked, and then they didn't work again. So there are a few gotchas like that that you have to worry about. Now, I'm gonna show you the rangefinder example, but first I wanna talk about command line development because I've showed you the IDE, you know what it looks like, and I'm not gonna use it anymore because I, I get fuddled up with the mouse. I'm kind of, a, I'm a command line girl. I like using make and emacs and vi. I'm not gonna get into that argument. I like them both. <laughs> Bye. And so these are the packages you need. They're available on pretty much all Linux distros. It's really easy to do. If you've dealt with ARM development, this is much easier because you don't have to worry about all those conflicting compilers. Everybody has the same compiler, except Arch. Arch Linux is broken, so everybody else works. You can, you can even develop, you, I, I recommend still using the Arduino library. So even if you know you're not gonna use Java, download the Ardu Arduino package anyway and use their libraries. You don't have to, it's possible to develop in straight C without any of the C++ libraries. You won't find any documentation, you won't get any help from anybody, everybody will be totally unsympathetic to you and you'll be sad. Don't do it. <laughs> Unless you're really, really, really stubborn. Now, of course, once you're sending stuff to the computer, in the IDE there's a way to read from the serial port, but <coughs> if you're using make and emacs and so forth, you can use emacs, you can use, per I mean, Sorry, you can use Python, you can use Perl, you can use C, you can use anything that can read from a serial line. But in Python, it's super easy, so that's usually what I do. And that's really all there is to it, just loop over that. Of course, I've, I have some error checking and things like that in my real program that I've deleted because it made the slide too long. Is that, is that using the same USB connector? Yes. Yes, it all uses the same USB connector. So that USB um, also has a Well, the, the Arduino just has one serial connection and that's how it gets its programming and also how it, how it prints things out or reads input. You can, also send, you can also send characters from Linux to it. Um, and this is on the Linux side. So on the Linux side, it's using the USB cable as a USB serial device, opening it so it'll be opening TTY USB zero or for some Arduinos, it uses a different driver and it'll be TTY ACM1. So just try them all. So for example. If you print the, the log messages and you plug it in, it'll, it'll, it'll key it, it'll find the device driver and it'll tell you which device it yeah. is. Yeah, you can look in dmessage and see what was connected. In fact, I'm, I'm sure I can do that here. <coughs> It's done something else in the meantime, so don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. So, for my range finder, files end in .ino. With earlier versions of the Arduino software, they ended in .pde. They arbitrarily changed the the extension, but don't worry about it. The file. It's pretty simple. Of course, all the source is online, and I'll give you a link to it at the end. So I, I won't really go over it, but it basically does what I already show you. It's it's going to read, and is it going to? Yeah. It's actually taking a bunch of readings and averaging them, and then printing. So it's a little bit more complicated than what I showed you, but it it works out to the same thing. So I'm going to build it. Range 
Pathfinder, of course. So I'm going, I have three wires here. I have a black wire, which is going to ground. Find that. A red wire, which is going to power. Green wire is going to pin zero. So this is my Python program, which is just printing out what's the serial that's printing from the Arduino. And if I put my hand in front of the sensor, nothing happens. Mm. Am I on the wrong pin? Yes. I'm on pin zero, and I should have been on pin one. Let's see if that's going to work. Huh. Okay, this demo may not be working out. Am I? Didn't you say that pin zero and one were compatible? Oh, um, yeah, I'm being confusing there. This is actually analog pin one. <laughs> which is different from digital pin one. So you're getting different values. Yeah, okay, I'm getting different values, but it's it's not being, it's not cooperating. So live demos. What kind of answer are we expecting here? Hmm? We're expecting probably around 300 when I'm pointing out <coughs> and maybe 50, 40, 30 when I put my hand in front. Is that milliseconds? Or is no, it it's just arbitrary. Uh, it's based on whatever voltage read or resistance readings that you can are hand in front of it without picking it up and see if the number changes. You're getting about 300. No. Oh, yeah, no, it is. Huh. Set it down mm -hmm. again and see if it reads 300. Okay. Then put your hand in front of it without picking it up. No, I don't yeah, think so. Yeah, I, I think we can skip this demo. <laughs> Take my word for We're it. We're brutal experimenters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> Anyway, you get the idea. It is reading stuff from the Arduino. So before I worked on my echolocation hat, I wanted a slightly simpler project. So what I did was I took a, this is actually a camera. It's an extremely cheap uh, webcam. And this is the rangefinder rubber banded onto it because I'm, I'm all about very professional looking <laughs> presentation. And here are the wires. So this is what I was just doing here. And in case the relationship between everything isn't clear, here's a diagram. So I've got the camera and the there's the line for the, it's a USB webcam, so it's connected to the computer. The computer is talking using Python and USB to the Arduino, which is plugged into the rangefinder, which is strapped to the camera, which then looks <coughs> at whatever's in front of the computer. So you come and sit down in front of the computer, the rangefinder sees there's somebody there and it turns on the camera. So if you've got a workstation at work that people keep using and you don't know who it is, <laughs> I thought maybe when you went away, you put up a picture of the cat. <laughs> yeah, you can do that too. I, I think I usually use timeouts for that, but you, know, you could be faster about it. Now, what about graphical output? I mean, you might be getting some of these sensors and wanting to look a little more graphically at what's going on. And there are ways of doing that. Not in the Arduino IDE, but of course, since you're, as long as you can get something coming over the USB cable with Python, obviously you can do anything you want with Python or Perl or whatever your favorite language is. And one example of this, when I was growing up, I always wanted an oscilloscope as a kid. You know, I, and they were really expensive. They were like a thousand dollars. And now you can maybe get one for a few hundred, but it's still a great big thing and my husband would get mad at me if I bought something that big to sit around the house when I didn't really need it. But I have something that can read input, digital or analog. I have something that can talk to a computer. Can I do something with that? 
So the first thing I'm going to do is, since I've, since I've wiped out the blink sketch, I'm going to put it back. short again. Oh, it already is short. Good. Okay, so I've got my LED blinking here. <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another Arduino. So this is going to be my signal source, and I'm going to use this Arduino as the oscilloscope. But in order to do that, since I didn't bring two USB cables, I'm going to power this one separately. So I'm going to plug a 9-volt battery into it. and unplug it from the USB cable. So now it's running separately. And then, now there's a program called Arduinoscope that you can get. It has a very simple program in it. It's pretty short. Basically what it's going to do is read all of its analog ports and print out like 1, 10, 9, 27, etc. It's going to print out a series of numbers. And then I have another program that's going to read that. So, so in order to do that, I need some wires. I'm going to tie the two grounds together. So the ground on this Arduino goes to the ground on this Arduino. Can we call you in for the, the hooking, hooking Linux up to nuclear reactors <laughs> project and have you do a live demo right here for us? Because you've got all uh, your tools and everything. <laughs> I think I need a radiation suit or something like that for that. And then I'm going to send. I don't know, you seem pretty well yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this. So in theory, I'm not putting those numbers. In fact, I could check that to see if I'm getting anything. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm connecting at the wrong speed. I'm reading it at 9600, so let's not worry about that. Let's just run simple serial Arduino scope. And this is not a program I wrote. It's a program I downloaded. And it runs in something called processing, which I'll talk about in a minute. Oh. We'll see if this works. Did I do that? <laughs> and, and look at that. I, I, have an, I have my own oscilloscope. Yeah. Why are you getting six channels? I was afraid somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> the reason I'm getting six channels when I only have it plugged into one is that the others are floating. I haven't grounded them. So if I, if I tied them down to ground, then I'd only see it on one channel. But that takes a lot of wiring, and it's tedious. The top one is a clean one. OK. Yeah. Oh, I see. Hmm. What? Is this one working? Sure. Yeah. Zero is working. And let's see which one. They should be labeled. Without an input, the sample and all the numbers. I'm not sure if it's the top or the bottom. Yeah, it's the top. Is it the top? Okay. It's for one sample hole with an analog output. It's just a capacitor and an analog multiplexer, so there's no input signal to, to recharge the cap with the new value. It's just one sample hole. Yeah. On that 180 Okay, so here again is pretty much what it did. 
And this is, it has to run at a higher speed than 9600 baud, which is why you were seeing gibberish from my monitoring program. But that's, it, it's a super simple program. And it's written in something called processing. If anybody went to the Bay Piggies talk a few weeks ago, there was a talk on processing, something similar to processing in Python. In theory, you could run Arduino scope under that, but I haven't tried it yet. Processing is another Java app, and so it, so it has all the advantages and all the disadvantages that go along with it, but it's very popular in the Arduino community. So you know, if you're interested in processing, if you know anything about it, if you've been wanting to get involved with it, this is a good reason. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, you can run graphics from anything. And one of the problems with Arduino scope and with processing in general is that there are several different models of Arduino and Arduino scope doesn't work with all of them because if it uses the other USB serial device, then processing won't read from it. And that's kind of a hassle. So, so it matters which of these two Arduinos I use. I, I couldn't swap them and still be able to run Arduino scope. And that's kind of a drag. So partly for that and partly because I tried to modify it and I found that processing and the Java environment and everything was just more than I wanted to deal with. And after I had sort of fiddled with it for a while, I thought, you know, I could just write this in Python and it would probably take less time. So I did. And, but the only thing is I, I ended up using a different protocol. There's a book called Practical Arduino that talks about oscilloscopes and it goes into detail about how to measure and all sorts of wonderful things. And it gives a protocol that's much more efficient. And I had a signal that was pretty fast that I wanted to measure. It was a lot faster than this blinking LED. So I used that protocol. And let's see where I'm How fast could you measure? I think not very fast. Um, yeah. Are No. Okay. No. It might be possible, but I haven't gotten it that fast. I think you'd have to use a lot of tricks. You cannot measure faster than the clock on the CPU, <laughs> which is 16 bits. Yeah. Measurements? Yeah. That's the maximum. After it's probably. Yeah, but what is So this looks a little less impressive. I, mean, I haven't worked on the graphics yet, but it's a proof of concept. You see the signals going up and down, and you can even, for faster signals, which I don't have to show you, it even lets you change the time, which Arduino Scope doesn't. So, yeah. So what graphics software you Oh, this is a Python GTK program. But let's get back to the question of what kinds of hardware you can talk to. And also, what kind of hardware are you going to want if you're going to play with this stuff? <laughs> you're definitely going to want a breadboard, probably lots of them. Uh, as you see, they're very useful. You stick your LEDs into them. You stick wires into them. You use them for everything. You will need a multimeter. You don't need a $200 fluke. You you know, just a $12 multimeter from anywhere is just fine. You'll eventually want a soldering iron, but you can wait till you need it to get it, and a cheap one is fine. And then just wires, LEDs, resistors, capacitors, and you know, we're, we're in such a wonderful place for that. You can go to Halted, you can go to Anchor. There are so many great places you can go and spend way more than you ever originally intended to because there's so much cool stuff around. Yeah, ham radio swap meets, or Where is it? that's a Foothill? Foothill, no, De Anza. De Anza, De Anza. De Anza. okay. Yep. De Anza. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, this, this is a great place to be involved with things like that. In fact, Halted has GPS units for, I think, $10 that I haven't figured out how to make them work with an Arduino yet, so don't buy them on the strength of my recommendation, but I think in theory they should work. And I've been wanting to set up a, hook up a GPS which you definitely can do. You can buy one for $60, $60 but I'm all about cheap, so mm -hmm. 
10 beats 60 any day. <coughs> Yeah, I should talk to you about those $30 ones, because I haven't seen them that cheap. 60 is about the lowest I've seen um, with bare wire connections. Yeah, I can tell you where to get some. Okay. $30. Good. The last like 35 or so. Yeah, still, that's it. Okay. So what's the $10? Um, I, actually, if you go to halted.com, they and search for GPS, I think, they have a link to something <laughs> like a data sheet, and it's not totally... It doesn't have all the data you might want, but it has some information, which is you know, you better than non-information. Yeah, it probably does require an antenna. They also sell GPS antennas, but they're big. They're not something I'd want to carry around. You know, this would be something to carry on hikes, so. You can also buy these things <coughs> called shields, which are things that plug into the top of your Arduino. And uh, these are all <coughs> Anyway, you remember that the Arduino has has those two rows of headers on the sides, mm -hmm. which are very well suited for plugging in something on top. And some of them stack on top of each other. Normally, you'll only have one shield on top of an Arduino at once. But you can get shields you know, that have LCD displays on them or even touchscreen displays, shields with Ethernet, Maybe Wi-Fi, I'm not so sure. Ethernet shields have been big in the community lately. Everybody's playing with them, not me. Uh, GPS, as I mentioned, data logging, sound and voice. There are just all sorts of things you can do. Here's a closer view of a kind of shield I like a lot, which is called a proto shield, which is a shield with nothing in it. So you can, you can put one of these micro breadboards inside and build any circuit you want. And I use my proto shield more than any other shield. It's it's really handy. So what does this shield really buy you, though? What does it do? Um, it only, mostly it just makes it more convenient because you don't have to be <coughs> handling several things that tend to pull apart. Okay. And in fact, I'll show you a little later. I'm going to put a shield on one of these, and I'll show you how it makes it easier. Okay. Thank you. And actually, this is another good example. This is, this is a data logging shield which comes with an SD card reader and a real-time clock chip with a battery. And there are libraries to deal with both of those things. So what I did was take a three-axis accelerometer, like the thing in, in your smartphone that tells which way you're tipping, and I wired it up with these wire wrap wires. I always wanted an excuse to play with wire wrap, and this is my first good excuse, so I've got wire wrap, wrap wires running underneath. And and then the Arduino is taking signals from the accelerometer and logging the three axes. And this is because I used to race autocross. And when I was racing, there was something called a G analyst that cost $300, which was so far beyond my budget at the time. And it was so cool. It would give you plots about how many Gs you were pulling laterally and how fast you were braking. And you could even do engine management by seeing how fast you were accelerating in Gs. It was, it was so great, and I always wanted one. And this is a G analyst, you know? It's got all that because these these accelerometers are so cheap now and so small. Where'd you get your accelerometer? I think I ordered this one from Adafruit.com. Adafruit, SparkFun.com, I mean, any of the Arduino specializing hardware. There, there are many dozens of places that cater to Arduino projects and, and they all sell these accelerometers. And just for most people that don't know, almost all the Android stuff on the accelerometer, almost all of it. Right. Even the cheap $100 yeah. Android mm -hmm. tablets or even some Wi Fi from the accelerometer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the chip costs almost nothing, so they put accelerometers into just about everything now, which and is great. You get it, it's spark fun or whatever that one is. So they, <coughs> the, the chip is really cheap, but they put it on a little board right. that you see there. So, right. so it's a lot easier. Yeah, you don't want to be buying that chip, which is a surface mount device, and trying to solder it yourself. You know, if, if you're good enough to do that, you don't need to be listening to me. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I mean, these, are, these things are really small. Just need a piece of <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe someday I'll learn to do that. But 
Surface Mount devices scare me. I, I like these little these little breakout boards that let you plug in. They can come from another source, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But this one, the accelerometer, I can't remember if it's three volts or, yeah, it's three volts. It's going to the three volt pin there. So, you know, it, it requires so low voltage and no current at all, so, so I might as well just plug it <coughs> into the But, yeah, you can, you can wire things, you can power things any way you want. So you get this data, you get like X, Y, Z, and so forth, and you log to the SD card, and then I have these date stamped files, and what do you do with them? <laughs> well, in Python, in three lines of Python, you can make a pretty nice plot with them. And what I'm doing is writing to a CSV file. So I'm, I'm just, I make files with names like logger00.csv, and I can show you what's in them if you, if you want to see them, but you know, it's just comma separated numbers. And this isn't a very interesting plot. This is just from driving around in the Civic for about 10 or 15 minutes. And PY Lab isn't always so good about its labels, but you know, in three lines, what do you expect? Okay, now here's an example where you definitely need to power things separately. With motors, you, know, you have a five volt output, so in theory you could you could take a small motor and you could plug one wire into ground and the other wire into an output pin and just send high or low or whatever. And you can even you can send pseudo analog <coughs> signals using something called pulse width modulation. So you can send something that, at least to a motor or a device like that, looks like an analog signal. But you don't want to do that because it's way too much current for an Arduino. An Arduino can only pass uh, 40 milliamps per pin or 200 milliamps max for the whole Arduino, all pins. And that's, you know, a motor might draw an amp or more. So if you pull too much, you might damage your Arduino. You might damage your Arduino when the motor shuts down. There's something called back EMF where it sends a pulse, of, you know, a, a pulse back to the processor. And I, I did this a few times before I knew the dangers, and I was lucky, but I don't recommend it. So what do you do instead? The easy way is something called a motor shield. And you can buy these for anywhere between about $20 and $50. Plugs into the top of your Arduino. It has a chip in it that lets it take an external power source. Let's see, where is that? Uh, I forget where the external power source is there. The same thing, the BN at the very top there. Yeah, okay. Well, but that's, yeah, that's plugging into the Arduino. So somewhere, somewhere yeah, around here. No, those are the ones that go to the motor. Okay. Yeah, I, I forget. But anyway, you, you do have an external power source for the motors, which can be anything you want, a great big battery or whatever. And then you have four pins to control the motor that go to the Arduino. So you can, you can run them in reverse. You can run them any direction. You can run them as fast as you want. And that works pretty well. But I've been experimenting with other ways of doing it because, as I mentioned, I'm going to be running a class, and we don't have funding to buy $20 shields for every group. You can use a 5-cent transistor. Um, sort of. You can use a transistor. Um, I'm not sure you can use a five cent one because you need a fairly high power one, so it might be 25 cents, but yeah, right. Yeah, you can use a transistor. What I have, I have a little RC truck that I got from a thrift shop and I ripped the RC stuff off so it just has motors now and I'm driving the motors and so I want to be able to go forward and back up and I want to turn both left and right and you can't go bidirectionally with a transistor. You need something called an H bridge. Four transistors plus a bunch of diodes plus a bunch of, yeah. you know, plus a lot of other stuff. And in fact, since we're talking about that, when I, I asked, there's an IRC channel on Freenode for Arduino, and people there are very knowledgeable, and they're pretty patient with people like me. And everybody's always asking about motors. Every day somebody asks about motors. Often it's me, but other, <laughs> other people too. <laughs> And they'll point you to an H-bridge circuit, 
which has components I didn't even know what they were. It turns out these are Darlington transistors, but I, I had to find that out. So you know, four Darlington transistors and four regular transistors and a whole bunch of resistors, and I'm, I'm thinking about me trying to solder up 20 of these for a class, and this isn't looking like a better solution to me. <laughs> you know, this looks kind of complicated. I don't know about you, but I don't want to build this. But it is an option, and people who do a lot of motor control, they do this, and that's the way to run big motors, because then you have control, you know, you can be sending 10 amps or however many amps you want, just by what transistors you choose. <coughs> and another solution, <coughs> I fly model airplanes, and model airplane motors are controlled by something called an electronic speed controller. So let's see. This goes to the battery, that goes to the motor, and that goes to the radio control receiver, but instead you can send it to the Arduino. But that doesn't go bi-directionally either because an airplane is you know, generally not going backwards. There are exceptions to that, but, but not with these speed controllers. You need something clever. <coughs> so, so that kind of worked as a proof of concept, and I had them lying around, but I don't really recommend it. As you say, the transistor <coughs> function works if you only want to go in one direction. You can also buy H-bridge chips, which don't cost much. They're under $5. In theory, you can wire those up. And, and in fact, the, the motor shield I showed you had an H-bridge chip on it, or a, actually a quad <coughs> half bridge, and I'm not sure of the difference yet. Still working on that. So anyway, I have more information than I have in these slides, but I don't really have the answer yet, so I haven't updated the slides yet. But you know, follow my blog if you care, or send me mail if you have ideas or whatever. I'm still working on motor control. And here's my little truck. <laughs> and this is, what am I using here? Oh, one, one really important thing I found that's true of all the solutions, it doesn't matter whether you're using a speed controller or a motor shield or a transistor, for all of them, a big limitation I found was the power source. Now this truck is made to run off four double A's and it's got something underneath where you can put four double A's in it. So I thought that's how I should power it, right? I should just make a connector to the, to the four double A's that are already there. And so I, I, I made a little connector for the Arduino. Didn't work at all. And the, the truck would sort of twitch a little bit and it wouldn't move. And it turns out that for some reason you need a lot more power to power. Even though an Arduino itself doesn't draw much current, somehow to power the, the combination of the truck and the Arduino, I needed a lithium ion or lithium polymer battery, which I happen to have lying around for <coughs> the model airplanes. But you know, if, if you find yourself playing with motors and your motors don't really go, it's probably that you don't have enough power. Maybe glitches on the battery, the, the motor may be putting pulses on the battery yeah. line that's confusing our Arduino. It, it might be driving the voltage so low that it's bringing a combination. Right. Move like it would with this lithium <coughs> polymer battery. So, oh, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty forgiving there. Um, you can do it down to five volts, but you probably want six through 12-ish. 12 is getting borderline. Um, nine volts is good, seven volts <coughs> is good, six, something around there is pretty much perfect. Well, it, has a voltage it has a voltage regulator built in, yes. And some of the cheaper Arduino options don't, and you can, you can take <coughs> just an Atmega chip and hardly any parts and build something like an Arduino without the voltage regulator. But if you have you know, the whole board like that, then it's pretty Catholic about what power it'll take. And oh, one other thing is that I tried powering the truck. I have a, a wall spud, one of those universal AC power supply things. It claims that it supplies an amp, which should have been plenty, right? And so I powered both the Arduino and the motors from that, wouldn't move it at all. So I think they're lying about that one amp rating. So don't really trust power supplies when they tell you that. Okay. Now I talked a lot about reading from the serial port, like when you're reading from, 
reading from the range finder or something like that. And I mentioned that you can also write to the serial port, so you can send commands to your Arduino while it's running. And that looks like this. Uh, basically, you ask how many characters are available, and then you read them. And on the other end, on your Linux box, open a serial port and write to it. So the code is easy on both sides. And the question is, why would you want to do that? You know, why, why would you want to send commands to your Arduino? Well, ah. <laughs> finally she gets to the sharp. <laughs> yeah, what if you have your AirSwimmer sharp and you aren't satisfied with it and you want it to do more? So I don't know if you've seen one of these sharks before. You have a controller and it has two buttons. Each button goes two ways. So this goes left and right to beat the tail back and forth. This goes up and down, which controls. This thing drives on a track, which controls the attitude of the shark. So when it swims, it'll swim more down or more up. And that's all very well, except this tail beating thing, you have to keep beating it. You have to go left, right, left, right, left, right. And that gets tedious really fast. And you know, isn't that the sort of thing that computers are for, right? <laughs> Automating repetitive tasks? <laughs> so there are two, thing, two ways you can do it. Of course, you can put an Arduino on the shark and have it put sensors on it and have it decide where to go. But I thought that for my first experiments, unleashing a fully autonomous <laughs> robo shark on an unsuspecting audience might not be a good idea. <laughs> Legal issues and everything. So, so what I decided to do was leave the controller in place so I can still use the controller on the shark <coughs> and use it normally. And I can override it if something mm -hmm. goes wrong. Mm -hmm. But talk to the controller from the Arduino controlled from Linux. And that way my Linux box can make the shark swim around. So of course, as soon as I got the controller, I, I ordered this just to do this project. But I had been wanting an excuse to order an AirSwimmer shark anyway. And the first thing I did was unscrew the controller, which is the first thing you should always do with any new hardware, right? right. <laughs> and fortunately, it was really simple. I thought it was going to be much harder than this, but obviously, you, know, you can see the switches right there. This is going to be easy. And OK, so we have four more screws. And this is the back of the same board. And each of the switches has four connectors. So these are the places where I soldered my wires. So I've got wires going into power and ground. It turns out I don't need power, but I wasn't sure. So I, you know, while I was in there, I, I added one. Four wires, one for each button. And then I put it all together. And I should have taken a picture while I had the wires there, but I didn't. So I got this nice ribbon cable. You can't actually buy six conductor ribbon cable, as far as I can tell, but you can pull it off a wider ribbon cable. And, and I've got these little frayed ends which I, on which I tinned some solder so I could plug them into the breadboard. And then what I have here is a transistor. Now again, I, I mentioned I'm not great at hardware. I have to ask people every time I do these sorts of things. How am I going to do this? And I thought relays were the way to go. And I bought many different relays, always finding that it was the wrong sort and there was something wrong with it and I couldn't get it to work. And I tried opto isolators, thinking that was going to be. And this is because I'm afraid of transistors. <laughs> but transistors are sort of black magic, and I wasn't sure how to use them. But OK, finally I got over my fear of transistors, and I found a good circuit online, again with help from IRC. And this is the circuit. It's pretty easy. I don't, I'm using a button at this point to, to just test. I'm not actually going from the controller buttons. But this is my circuit. So you know, I have a 1K resistor per, for each button. I have a transistor going to one of the digital outputs, a <coughs> and a wire to the sharp button. So. Yeah, when you the buttons are high normally, and you, when you press them, they get grounded. And well, what's the high voltage? 
Oh, um, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's got two triple A's, so it's three volts. So you I, should be able to connect it directly to the yeah. Yeah. without yeah. the transistor. Um, there was some reason that didn't work. Yeah. So I, well, the, but the Arduino. Wait, voltage. but the Arduino signals are five volts, not three. Oh, oh um, okay. On the yeah. Arduino, you can power something with three volts, but <coughs> logic signals are five. Oh, but okay. I mean, so I, I guess I could have. Yeah. You don't have open brain devices. Yeah. Well, that's. You now you can actually get three volt Arduinos. The lily pads that I mentioned that are used for clothing, those are three volt, and I think you can get <coughs> other models that are three also. But that you know, I was I was working with a normal one. The five the volt volts. Okay, so I mentioned that I was going to talk about why it's nice to have a proto shield. And uh, this is why it's just, it's so nice to keep this all together and not have to plug it in every time. So, so I've got my proto shield. Got my controller. Uh, and then there's my other Arduino. Ah. Mine happened to be in a package I got from Radio Shack, so probably ten times what they normally go for. <laughs> 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 probably Dan, I just bought a, like, uh, hundred from Jerry Cole for like two dollars, and it's a Yeah, yeah I, I probably paid that much for six or eight of them. talked about the code and I don't actually have a slide on it but so it's a it's a little bit longer and and again I, I won't go over it in detail but what it's doing basically is writing you know it, it's reading a protocol like I can send um, you know r300 and it'll move the tail right for 300 milliseconds it's it's that sort of thing, so this is just reading the serial port and and doing it's appropriate. It's a domain things. specific language that you've invented in Python. Yes, it's a domain specific language <laughs> that I invented in Python. <laughs> then, so that should be running, and I'm going to turn. Transmitter on and release the shark. Thank you. Release the shark. <laughs> you know what I didn't do though? One thing about the shark is that he needs some ballast because otherwise it's pretty close actually, but I'm gonna give him some ballast. So he doesn't float up to the ceiling, because that would be a drag. Ballast resistor doesn't work either. A little too. The shark comes with clay that you put into this receptacle. Okay. Nice, okay. That'll be fine. Stick with Arbu Dun. Arbu Dun. Okay, so transmitter is on. This is unfortunately infrared, so one problem with it is that you have to keep these lights pointed approximately at the shark. Darn, 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 darn. Okay, now I'm going to try manual control uh, first. I think I need a little more balance, though. I just don't want to lose them in the ceiling. How 
wants a paper <coughs> review. Uh, it'll stay. It'll stay for several weeks. Maybe they say a month, but I haven't. See, there he goes. Run away, shark. I'll bump it away. <laughs> In that case. Yeah, it is. I was supposed to do this before, but I don't think the air outside would have been the same temperature. So they had you fly shark through. Okay. Now, in theory, manual control should work, and it does. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't messed up manual control. I haven't destroyed my shark. And then I have my little shark window program. Very minimalist program. <laughs> cool. Professional courtesy. Is he a lawyer? Is this a homing shark? <laughs> so you need another Arduino app to keep a laser target. Yeah. I can see the use so now you can sell a range fire. <laughs> 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 this is the first time Shark has flown a Silicon Valley controlled by a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's millisecond.
seconds that it'll send the so the amount of time it'll send that impulse on that line. Okay. Um, seems to have lost my shark leash, but maybe he'll stay. <coughs> he could still attach to the yeah. 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 Over there. Over here. Okay. Um, that's that's basically the end of the talk. <laughs> 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 Gilbert just happened to come out with us right when I was working on this project. <laughs> but mine flies. <laughs> <laughs> It's just called Arduino. Go to arduino.cc and click download. <coughs> Good question. I don't know. Throw a copy. Cultural islands. Yeah. Yeah. Why they pick CC? I don't know. Why it's not dot .it or something? Yes. There. Uh, this is part of the Open Hardware Initiative, I believe. And there is another community with the Beagle Board. You may know about that. And I think they just came out with the Beagle Board. Mm -hmm. And there is a Beagle Board XM, mm -hmm. which are more high-end hardware. Mm -hmm. Microchip has a 32-bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that's it, yeah. Yeah, Beagle Bones actually are not so much Arduino competitors, partly because they're much more expensive. They're real computers. I mean, they're full-fledged computers. They can talk to displays. What they don't have is analog input or output, so you have to use an analog to digital converter mm -hmm. if you want to do Arduino type stuff with them. But for digital input and output, they're okay. Um, I, I went to some Beagle talks at scale, and actually it sounded like the kernels they normally use on them, no, it's not the kernels, it's that um, they have GPIO inputs on the chip, but they aren't actually exposed on the board, so you have to do some soldering if you want to do that. So. You know, they can be used for that, but it's, they're not really aimed at that market. They're aimed at other things. Now, the, the Raspberry Pi, on the other hand, apparently does have exposed GPIO, so when we're finally able to order them, it you will be... Order them. They have got in until the first week of next month. Um, I haven't <coughs> even been able to order them. You can I ordered order. one uh, Sunday night from Newark. Okay. got information on Monday that day. Okay, because every time I go to either of the sites, I get you can register interest. And so what is a Raspberry Pi? A Raspberry Pi is an ARM-based board, which is much faster and more powerful than Arduino. It can do digital input and output, no analog. Uh, but it should be very good for things like embedded robot operations. And I think once I have my car working, I might, I might get a Raspberry Pi for that because it, it could do things like image processing that the Arduino isn't really fast enough to do. And they might work well together. You know, as, as you see, the Arduino works well as a data collection device for a Linux box, and it would work that way for a Raspberry Pi too. You could plug it into a Raspberry Pi, collect data from your Arduino, and then process it on the Raspberry Pi, or any combination. So would you use the new debugger on the Not on the Arduino. There's, there is no debugger I know of, but the programs are so simple, normally you don't really need to debug the program logic. You know, you're, you're more debugging your circuit and, your, and the Linux side of it. So I've been working with the uh, SPM mm -hmm. microcomputer $10 uh -huh. for the discovery kit. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of the opposite that you have a USB, but it only works with the same kind of debugger. But yeah. basically it'll run they use GDB as part of their open source huh. development. So you can single step uh -huh. sort of inside the microcomputer and uh -huh. examine registers and all that stuff. But then okay. you can't use the USB for serial ports. You have to have a separate yeah. um, 
Yeah, I don't know any way to do things like single stepping on the at mega. It's possible that if there, there's an at mega has an AVR development environment for their 32 bit chips. And I'm not sure if it would work for the 16 bit chips or not. I, I haven't tried it because I find it harder to use than the tools I currently use. Yeah. I'm trying to develop some software to control <coughs> a robotic hand and arm. Mm -hmm. I saw that the, on the screen it said that you have 32 kilobytes of memory. Do you know if there is software to a develop an advanced neural network oh, that would run on the Arduino. You wouldn't want to do that on an Arduino. <coughs> you know, any, anything like that, you'd want more processing power. Can yes. you tell us about the community, maybe in the Silicon Valley, about Arduino and hardware, uh, open source hardware? No, that's a really good question. There have got to be a million people doing this stuff in Silicon Valley. I don't know them. I don't know where they go. I don't. Uh, the, I think we we really need a hackerspace devoted to things like electronics and Arduinos and so forth. And I don't know of one. Do you know? Um, has anybody ever heard of a place called the Hacker Dojo? Yes. <laughs> How many people would they please raise their hands if they would as a volunteer, who have visited the Hacker Dojo and have seen the hardware space? Oh, you have not seen the hardware space. When you walk through the front doors, the door immediately to your right goes into the bat cave. No magic is allowed. Well, it's all hardware. That? It's all, <laughs> they have a whole bunch of things. They have uh, large magnifying glasses, microscopes. People are doing, hacking all kinds of hardware stuff there all the time. Uh, you don't have to be a member to go in and use it. It is welcome that you come in and it would be nice if you became a member but it's it's uh, a very good hardware space people are doing things maybe not so simple as this or as complicated as this but people are also doing things where they're doing hardware hacks on their androids or their phones and other things like that if not only a repair yeah well, that's good news. I had seen So homebrew robotics. I'm going to check that out. Oh, oh yeah, thank you for that. Homebrew robotics goes back many, many years, I believe. And uh, I forget that what is the guy's name, Richard. Uh, he's run it. Dick yeah. Prather. Yeah. thing called Muscle Wire yeah. that's in there. And one of the guys that's from the Homebrew Robotics Club sells it. Well, it's actually two guys. And uh, John was over there. John Silco and I met him when they were nothing. And they were just putting ads in magazines. And now they've got a great company. You know, and it's one of the backbones of the robotics industry. Um, back to you. I've seen articles about the high school projects for robotics. They have some competition every spring. Do they use these uh, devices or do they do something else? I have not heard of a high school robotics project using Arduinos yet. And I don't understand why not. But do you know what they do use? I've heard of, I think. I, noticed, I, I have a friend who has a kid in the high school and he's in a cool robotics class. It's some company that sponsors this. Yeah. I've, I've heard. No, uh, it's not Lego. I, it's, it's, but there's somebody else. Yeah, but it's something like that. I've that heard of high school programs Concord, using Concord PIC microcontrollers. Or basic stamp microcontrollers, maybe some of the older ones, but mm -hmm. more, it's more complicated than basic stamp. It's more, okay. more digital, more packaged. Okay. Yeah, more like Lego mind storm.
it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly in that vein. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm drawing a blank as to what the name of the company is. Could, could there are these, um, also these uh, chip kits, so these two bit processors that are pin compatible with Arduino and can follow the same protocol? And uh, you know, the A32 bit processor is the same as uh, uh, chip writing as well. Is there also up. open source hardware? If you register, go there, a lot of the vendors give away stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I got an Atmega chip a demo unit yeah. from Atmega last year, which I still haven't done gives anything away, with. You know, stuff that yeah. Next week gives away stuff that you know you get. You can easily walk away with a couple hundred dollars worth of hardware. Yeah. yeah. So not only that, if you register, at least if you register ahead of time, you can get an exhibit area for free. Yeah. Takes us a little bit of time ahead because it's mostly during the day. You might have to keep track of the work schedule, so but it's well worth it. And last year in the exhibit hall, they had a T-Rex skeleton, a real one. So that was pretty cool. I don't know if they're doing that this year. Any other questions? Well, thanks a lot. Performing without a net. <laughs> There's usually a bunch of us about this time who are both gregarious and hungry. So, for those of you who are interested, we typically go over to Frankie, John and, Johnny, and Luigi's 2 restaurant, which is on the far side of El Camino between Shoreline and Castro in Mountain View. So, there is typically a bunch of people who want to go there. Can I have a show of hands about who wants to go? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Just so we know how big a table to ask for. One other uh, uh, quick thing, because the guy mentioned the uh, Embedded Systems Conference and uh, triggered a memory. A month ago, I was at the um, <coughs> Android Silicon Valley Meetup, which is uh, in uh, Palo Alto, right by the freeway. And I was talking to people there about trying to get Debian on tablets. Had an extended conversation with a, a guy for about an hour, and he was saying probably um, because some of the uh, tablets that are available now have a substantial component of, of closed hardware, he was suggesting that uh, I and maybe other people interested go to the Embedded Systems Conference and say, um, what would it take for uh, vendors to, to get uh, a, um, like a, t a tablet device which is totally open because it's, it's created by, as open hardware by the community rather than by a company who wants closed hardware. And then on this, uh, it would be very straightforward because the thing's all open, you can put Linux on it. So that's, that's another plug for a reason to go to the Embedded Systems Conference and see about, ask about you know, how to get hardware and then the display to make by an open, open design uh, tablet. Okay, Why don't you talk one, to me about One last this? announcement here so we all can get out of here. We should be out of here right about now. Uh, the BSD Users Group meets tomorrow night we're meeting at Yahoo. We, do not, we usually meet over at IX System or Hacker Dojo. So you go to bafug.org if you're interested in BSD. And then next week, at the same time, in this same location, the ACCU meets the Association of CSD++ Users. And that's it. Let's all get out of here. What's the BSD meeting. topic? 7 o'clock. What's the topic? Is there a meeting? Whatever. Topic? I don't know. Look on the website. Yahoo. I post in two words to Google. Fun stuff. So hold on, just a second. I'm going to find that lady and who? Um, who's the dude who was sitting right back? The guy who was with us. He disappeared right in front of my eyes. Right? Well, I know. He's right. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. Um,
way cool. So you're going to go to the dinner? Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't have a head map. From the people that are there. Yeah, yeah. 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 pipe on it. Nice. Eight o'clock. And everybody, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Louis, uh, Patrick, I believe, from the Oriental. Good to see you. Yeah, I got a chance to